afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Sunday. It's a gorgeous, sunny day. I hope you're able to have some time to go for a walk today and soak in some of the sun and some fresh air. We're here today at 1 o'clock, and we'll be here every day this week at 1 o'clock. I'd encourage you to keep tuning in. Uh, I'll have a lot of news this week as we start to turn to the task of thinking about what life might be like um, under a set of new conditions as we look forward to getting out from the from the extra rigid conditions under which we've been living. So I look forward to uh, being with you uh, in this way every day this week at 1 o'clock. Uh, I want to begin by reminding everybody um, to continue with the vigilance. You're doing a great job. Contact tracing notebook every single day, every day, right in your contact tracing notebook. Who were you with and where were you? It's, it could be life-saving. Uh, if you are tested positive. So please make sure to do that. Keep yourself six feet away from everybody. Avoid crowds of five or more people. Wear your cloth face covering to cover your nose and mouth whenever you're out and about. Work from home, uh, if at all possible. Uh, if you have to commute to Massachusetts to work, go ahead and commute. Come home and stay at home when you're home. This is a very unnatural way to live. And it is my goal and desire to move us out of these restrictions as soon as is safely possible. Um, but I have to say the only way we're going to do that is if everybody hangs in there just a bit longer and stays hunkered down and following the rules. I know it's hard, and today's Sunday. Many of us used to going to church, can't do that. So uh, hang in there. Know that it is working. It's absolutely working. We are seeing, you can see the numbers on the screen, um, they're going up, but not nearly as fast as we would have thought. At this point, I, you know, the, the, cur the slope of the curve is much gentler. The peak will not be nearly as high as it would have been had we not taken these measures and complied with them when we did. So it's tough, but it's working, and I want to say thank you. A few, we'll keep it reasonably short today. It's a Sunday. I'm joined by the fabulous Dr. McDonald. We wanted to give Dr. Nicole a few hours at least to be with her family on a Sunday, but she's well and doing, doing fine, uh, better than fine. She's fantastic. Um, so I'm going to just tick through a, a few items that I think are relevant and timely. First thing, uh, we spoke yesterday at length about the fact that um, 45% of all of our positive cases in Rhode Island are among the Latino community. And Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott uh, shared that yesterday and spoke about the fact that that's obviously very concerning to us and we're trying to, first of all, figure out why and second of all, figure out what more can we do to address it. Um, it, is our, it is our core principle through this whole crisis that we have an inclusive approach and work overtime to make sure that everybody uh, has health care, everybody's included in our response, and that means everybody, including the most vulnerable, including people of color, including the immigrant community, including people in neighborhoods of certain zip codes. Uh, the trend is not unique to Rhode Island. It's a similar thing that you see in many other states, but that doesn't make it acceptable at all. It means we have more work to do. It means we have work to do to understand why. You know, why is this? What is going on in these communities um, such that th there would be such a high uh, preponderance of the cases? And then secondly, what do, we, what do we have to do? We need to do more. We need to do better, and we're committed to doing that. To that end, I want to make a couple of announcements today. I am very pleased to announce that we are opening the state's first drive up and walk up site uh, in Providence. It'll be located in the parking lot of the Bailey Elementary School in Providence. We're doing this uh, in partnership with the Providence Community Health Center. And I have to say I'm deeply grateful to the Community Health Center, all of them actually, for what they've been um, doing in partnership with us. I also want to remind everyone that anyone regardless of income or immigration status, can seek health care at any of our community health centers. 
in any event, the, this is going to be a walk-through site. You can walk through or drive through, but we know that many people don't have cars, and it's, we've selected the Bailey Elementary School because it's centrally located in an area of Providence where a lot of folks might not have a car, they might not be able to get up to the Twin River site, so you can walk to this site and receive your testing. Now, I want to be crystal clear about this. You still need an appointment. So you, you can't just walk over, if you feel like you need to be tested or if you feel sick, you can't just walk over to the Bailey Elementary School. You have to call your doctor or call the Department of Health or call the Providence Community Health Center or call an urgent care center. You have to get yourself to a health care provider by phone and then they will set up an appointment for you and you can either walk over or drive over to the testing site at the Bailey Elementary School. Um, the full list of health care clinics in Rhode Island is available on the Department of Health's website uh, in Spanish, in English, in, in multiple languages. And I would just encourage everybody uh, to, to check out that website, especially if you don't have a doctor who you see regularly. Now's the time you, you want to find a doctor who you can call and trust. And again, you cannot go to the walk-up center, to the walk-up testing center, unless you have an appointment first from your doctor. Um, there's still so much more to do. Clearly putting one walk-through site in, in Providence is not nearly enough, but it's a beginning and it's an important step. It's in the community. It's in a well-located place in the community to be accessible, and it's an important step, and I want to thank everybody who worked extra hard to make that possible. Uh, a couple of more announcements. As I mentioned yesterday, we've been spending a lot of time trying to understand what's going on and why is the Latino community so, so hard hit. And to that end, I obviously am consulting m many people in the community, many stakeholders who can provide me with good advice and counsel and also who can get information out to the community. And I want to put a few thank yous out there, people who've agreed to be advisors and who have been advising us. Dr. Pablo Rodriguez, thank you, Pablo. Mayor Diosa, Representative Grace Diaz, and Providence City Council President Sabina Matos, um, among others. You've, you've been great, and we need to continue to rely on you even more. Um, we need your help. We need your help in getting the word out to the community that they have to obey the stay-at-home order, have to wear masks, um, have to obey social distancing. What, like, what are we hearing in the community? What more can we do? How can we do a better job of helping folks, whether that's food delivery so they can be safe and quarantine, more mobile testing, better access to health care? So we're going to be spending a lot more time uh, with these advisors, and we're going to stay at it. We will stay at it until we until we do a better job and, and until everyone has the access to the testing and the health care uh, and the high quality food and education that they need in order to keep themselves, their families, and their communities safe. The other thing we're doing is in an effort to increase our outreach and our public education message. Uh, we'll be embarking on an advertising effort in the coming days to get more of our messages out uh, on Latino radio and through other Spanish media outlets. So none of it's perfect, it's not enough, but it's, it, they're all important steps and I look forward to working together with the community to continue to address these issues. Um, a couple of other announcements. Uh, the next one's a difficult one. Uh, obviously nothing about the pandemic is easy, essentially nothing that I have had to say to you or share with you in the past six weeks has been easy. Um, and the fact is that staying physically distant from loved ones is hard. It's hard. It's very hard not to visit your mom, dad, aunt, or uncle in their assisted living facility, not to be able to visit a loved one who's in the hospital 
not to be able to check in on somebody who's in a nursing home. It's, it doesn't feel human, it doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel loving. And yet it's the way we're forced to live right now um, so that we can keep everybody safe. This is especially a difficult time for those families experiencing the loss of a loved one, either in the ordinary course of events or through illness or through coronavirus. Um, the fact is life's going on. Life goes on through this. And a number of our loved ones are passing away through the crisis. Unfortunately, we cannot relax the social distancing guidelines, even as it relates to funerals. So I, uh, I do want to remind you that there is a law in effect which says that there are to be no gatherings of greater than five people. And that means no gatherings, no social gatherings, including funerals. It's, um, and we, unfortunately, we've seen in other states that funerals can be a vector for the virus. We've seen in other states that in, you know, out of good intentions to allow funerals to be bigger, unfortunately it's become a vector for the virus and we've seen a spread. So it's truthfully heartbreaking for me to say this, but it is necessary and I've checked in again and again with our public health officials. They tell me it's necessary. So please realize that these guidelines of five or fewer apply to all social gatherings, including funerals. Uh, today is a Sunday. It's a day that I hope most of you are able to take off from work and relax a little bit. Uh, it, it's important that we find time to do that. Having said that, there's a lot of folks who don't get the day off, even though it is Sunday. There's healthcare workers who are working, uh, state employees who are working, first responders who have to work. And I especially want to take a minute now to call out the people at the Rhode Island EMA, the Emergency Management Agency, run by Mark Pappas, who leads that organization, reports to me, he's doing a terrific job. But if you go down to the EMA, they don't get Sundays off. In fact, they haven't gotten a day off since we've started this. So to, to my team at the EMA, Thank you. I know it's hard. The days are long. Sunday's no different than Monday. It's no different than Saturday. It's all one big work day. But you're doing a great job. You're making me proud, and you're making Rhode Islanders proud. And um, we probably don't say thank you enough. But to Mark and your team at the EMA, thank you. And uh, keep up the great work. You know you're tired, but you're getting the job done for everybody, and we're grateful. Yesterday, I want to take a minute to talk about masks. Yesterday was the day that my executive order around mask wearing went into effect. I signed it Tuesday, but it went into effect yesterday. I wanted to give businesses and all of us a few days to get ready to comply. I would like to take a second to remind you of what that order says. Essentially, as a general rule, employees of all businesses and nonprofits must wear uh, cloth face coverings at all times while at work. And customers of businesses such as retail stores, grocery stores, and the like also must wear a cloth face covering. Um, I want to assure you we're doing that. You know, we, I take my mask off to deliver the press conference, but when Dr. McDonald and Brett and I are in the office, we have our face cloth coverings, and you should too. And certainly, if you're going out and about, going to the grocery store, it's an absolute must. And if you're a business, it, you must provide these face cloth coverings to your cashiers, to your employees, because it's required that they wear them uh, every day, all the time, when they're at work. Now. I'm very pleased to say that we had terrific compliance yesterday, uh, which is great. I mean, the very first day, DBR, Department of Business Regulation, sent out, to, sent out inspectors, unannounced, to over 200 retail locations all across Rhode Island yesterday, and they found that both employees and customers were wearing face coverings. So I want to say thank you. Great job. 200 businesses, they didn't know we were coming, and compliance was terrific. 
We're going to continue to do these unannounced inspections, and it is my expectation that we'll continue to pass with flying colors. Just bear down and let's do it. Don't look for ways to get out of it. Let's figure out creative ways to, to get it done, to keep all of us safe. There are a few ways that we can improve based upon what we saw yesterday, and I'd like to share them. Um, first of all, it's important that the mask covers both your nose and your mouth. It can't just cover your mouth, it has to cover your nose and your mouth. So that either means you need a bigger mask or maybe just pull it up over your nose to make sure it's covered. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, uh, you can go to the Commerce RI website, Commerce RI website, and they have um, all kinds of good information there, how, where to get a mask, how to make a mask, how to wear a mask. You can also go to the Mask Up RI Instagram account. There's some excellent images, Mask Up RI Instagram account. You'll get some fun ideas and you'll see the best ways to safely wear a mask. I also have to make another point that the inspectors asked me to make, and it relates to uh, drive-through, drive-through food and coffee delivery. All of the employees at the drive-through windows were wearing masks. So big thanks to the retailers and restaurants and coffee shops. Great job. Day one, great compliance. I know it's hard. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Unfortunately, many of the customers who drove up um, to pick up their food through a drive through window did not have a mask on. So I want to remind you that you're not six feet away from somebody when you're um, at a drive through When you reach over to the window to, um, to pay or to get your food, you come in one, two, three feet of distance from the employee who's at the drive through counter, which means you must have your mask on. Uh, the germs can spread through the air, and unless you're able to be six feet away, you have to wear your mask. Remember, the cloth mask will not protect you from getting the disease, but it will go a long way towards preventing you from spreading it. So just, you know, have kindness. If the person who's giving you your food or your coffee in the drive through you know, they're at work, they're probably anxious, they're probably scared to be at work, so let's do the right thing and keep them safe and make sure have your mask on if you're going through the drive through And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. McDonald. So thank you, Governor Armando. And I want to say good afternoon to my fellow Rhode Islanders. And I know there's others from outside the state who follow the Rhode Island story. So good afternoon to you as well. So there were 230 of us yesterday who were diagnosed with COVID-19, and regrettably, 13 of us passed away yesterday. Um, that's, that brings us to a total of 150 uh, folks who have passed away from, from COVID-19 so far in Rhode Island. The ages of the folks who passed away yesterday, there was two folks in their 60s, four in their 70s, four in their 80s, and, and three in their 90s. Um, there's about 254 folks admitted to the hospital right now, and there's 70 people in the intensive care unit. Of that 70, 43 are on a breathing machine. Um, that means there's a machine that breathes oxygenated air in for them, and then through a plastic tube right through their trachea, it comes out and exhales the carbon dioxide. So the machine's breathing for those 43 folks right now. I do want to talk a little bit about the enormous work that's going on with nursing homes right now. Uh, just give a little context about that. You know, one of our main efforts right now is when we have a nursing home outbreak is testing all the patients in the nursing home and all the staff as well. And, and that's really important for folks to know, but all nursing home employees should be cognizant about this. And I think one of the things Dr. Alexander Scott brought forward uh, yesterday was our plan is to do cyc cyclical testing of nursing homes. In other words, you know, prearranged, rather routine testing of nursing homes of the residents and the staff. We're going to be starting with the nursing homes with the most cases and then nursing homes with no current cases. Um, and this is really going back to the top of the list. It's really more of a surveillance type approach. I mean, surveillance is a little different than case finding. What we're just trying to do is see what everybody's doing over there. And nursing homes are a high priority area to keep everybody in the nursing home as safe as possible. 
We're also working with nursing home facility administrators, nursing home staff, so people can only work at one facility. So we're urging folks who work in nursing homes to just try to work at only one um, facility. I, I want to talk a little bit too about something we started in Rhode Island. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, we started something called respiratory clinics. You know, if you have uh, the symptoms of COVID-19 and you need to see your doctor, uh, one of the ways you can do this, because we had such a shortage of personal protective equipment, was to go to the clinic that was specially designed for this. So there's about 36 respiratory clinics in Rhode Island, and about 23 of those clinics will see patients from any practice at all. And, and these, these are in addition to your urgent care centers or your regular primary care provider. Um, but if you think you have COVID-19, you can be tested at this site, but you also can have an evaluation done. Now, it might be from your car, uh, where a doctor or nurse practitioner or physician assistant might come up to your car and listen to your heart and your lungs, look at your eyes, your head, ear, nose, and throat, and do it do a COVID test if it's needed, um, but they can diagnose other problems because not everything is uh, COVID-like illness right now. So that's just another resource for you. If you want to know the locations or the phone number, there's a website we have called health.ri.gov backslash COVID slash testing. So C-O-V-I-D slash testing. Uh, we have this information in Spanish as well on our COVID-19 uh, page. Please do remember, though, if you're going to go to one of the restaurant clinics, you need to call first. And that's just a theme in any time you're going to have a medical experience right now is you want to call first. Having said that, I want to just remind us, though, that if we need medical care for whatever reason, we need to go access it. You know, the doctor's offices aren't closed, and emergency departments certainly aren't closed. And if you need to have an emergency care experience, you really need to access, and you shouldn't be afraid of calling 911. Um, it's important to keep in mind that if you're having something like chest pain, or a serious head or spine injury, or a sudden or severe pain somewhere. If you need to go to the emergency department, you should certainly go. If you need to call 911, you should go. You know, we want to be appropriate about our emergency department usage. Uh, that's important. But the emergency departments in Rhode Island are adequately staffed. They have plenty of personal protective equipment. So I'm not asking anyone to go there who doesn't need to, because they're convenient. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is that if you need to go to the emergency department, they're there for you. And, and same with our 911. We have a lot of the first responders who are doing a fabulous job and doing really good work there. And so we want to make sure we know to re, you know, remind them. We thank them for everything they're doing for us, and they're there for us. One of the things to keep in the back of your mind is if you have a medical problem that you're not paying attention to and you're just waiting for it to get better, you know, that could actually make it worse for all of us when this surge comes. You know, and I think it's important for us to keep that in the back of our mind. I was talking to a colleague of mine. His dad had a terrible sore throat. He'd been to the doctor the day before, but he couldn't swallow. He couldn't swallow food. He couldn't follow, swallow water. He just couldn't swallow. And, and I said to myself, well, your dad needs to go to the emergency department. Just, just let them know you're coming. Um, you know, he had a terrible abscess in his neck, but he had an operation to fix it. He was in the hospital a few days, and he got better. And that's the ending we want, though. We don't want things, though, to get so bad, though, where you do create a problem for us during the surge. So I want to be careful about that. Other things to keep in mind is there's sometimes we really do need to go to the doctor. If you're pregnant, we need to make sure that you and that baby you're taken care of. And if you have that baby, we well, need that baby to have their checkups and have their baby shots, because that's really important too. You know, kids need their vaccines. We need to do those kind of things. We have to remember, COVID-19 is happening, but everything else is happening too, right? So we have to make sure that we do some of these things in person. Now, a lot of doctor's offices are doing telehealth visits or virtual visits. You know, I've even seen it with some of my own patients. Do a visit over an iPhone or the computer. It's, it, it works. You know what? I, it actually, I think some of the patients actually prefer because they have to leave their house, and you can get a lot done. So if you can do that telehealth visit, that's awesome. But if you do need to go, just call the doctor first, and they'll see you because the doctor's offices are open here. And, you know, I think if you have questions about your health, that's really a great place to go. Um, your doctor is someone you trust and you know, and they know you and trust you as well. Uh, so it's important to kind of keep that in mind as well here. Keep in mind that the urgent care centers are open and they're happy to take care of you for the problems too. Like you broke a bone or something, whatever you need to do, the urgent cares are ready for you. Um, I just wanna just talk a little bit about masks for just a reason. So I, I brought my, the, the governor was talking about our masks and, and she's right, I have mine with me here. And I, time for a little show and tell. Um, so Rosa Morales, who works for the Board of Nursing at the Department of Health, Rosa was very kind and she made us all masks in the office. I mean, good for her to have that talent of sewing and making. She cares about us. I just want to say thank you to Rosa. It's a beautiful thing to do. But when you put the mask on, it's funny. I was talking to my brother Joe the other night. He called me, and Joe was saying, like, he lives in New York. He's got to go to the supermarket, and he was going to wear his mask, but he felt kind of funny. And I think that's how a lot of us feel right now. It's like, this is new. 
it's kind of different. It's like, you know, no one wants to go to the costume party and not wearing a costume, right? So this is what we're all wearing right now is masks. So this is how I put mine on. And you see it fits right over my ear loops. It's a little harder to hear me this way, but see how it covers my nose and covers my mouth? And as the governor said, I wear this mask to protect you from me. Because here's the problem. Sometimes people are carrying the COVID-19 virus and we don't have symptoms. So when you don't know what you don't know, you might hurt people. So the key concept here is wear your face mask and maybe you're around other people. And I think that's just something we can all go home with today and do. And if you, know, if you have to make a mask, make a mask. I want to thank you and I'm going to turn it back over to Governor Raimondo. Thank you, Doctor. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're going to begin with Steph Machado from WPRI Channel 12. This is the second day in a row with a drop in cases, but with new community testing sites popping up, are you expecting the daily count of positive cases to go back up? Mm. It's a good question and it's hard to say. So of course we're looking for a trend on any one day or two days there'll be an up and a down and an up and a down. We see a little bit less testing over the weekend, uh, so we have to take that into account for yesterday. Uh, we'll see. You know, the honest answer is I'm not sure. Uh, we'll see. We'll monitor it. We tend to look at things in terms of a three-day average. That gives us a little bit better of a sense of the trend. So it's too soon to tell, but I'll take it. It's a great, it's a great thing that, the, that we don't see uh, a much bigger number today. Steve Alquist from Uprise RI says you say our health care workers are the bravest among us, but many of them are poorly paid and underprotected. Many are members of the Latino community and are the hardest hit. Many are told that they have to work or face economic ruin. Yes, so again, there's no doubt about it that the, the health care workers today are absolutely the bravest, um, particularly the certified nursing assistant or nurses who are in these nursing homes, quite literally working on the front lines. And what our job is, is to make sure they have enough personal protective equipment to keep them safe, that we are putting a huge emphasis on our nursing homes with strike teams and mobile testing. Uh, everyone can now take a minimum of 10 sick days. We have COVID-related TDI, temporary disability insurance. And if you do lose your job uh, or have a COVID-related reason that you can't perform your job, there's unemployment insurance and there's the new pandemic unemployment assistance. So and none of it's enough, but we're building up supports and even yesterday, I was on the phone advocating that what we need Congress to do is put forth a package of additional pay, you know, bonus pay, hazard pay, work pay for healthcare workers. Uh, because as you, you rightly say, they're doing the hardest work and they deserve to be paid more. And I'm gonna stay on that and see if we can make something happen. This next question may be on the minds of many. John DePietro asks, can you share your thoughts on hair salons? Could they begin to reopen if they meet certain criteria, such as appointment only, limit the number of people, practice social distancing, and the staff and customers wear masks? When is the earliest you see them reopening? I'm thinking that's John's way of telling me I need a haircut. Uh, so I don't know. I'll say this. The, that hairdressers, barbers, nail salons, those fall into the category of what we've called close in contact businesses tattoo parlors, et cetera. And to be very honest, those are some of the toughest calls to make. So I would not expect hairdressers and barbers and close in contact businesses to be among the first wave to come back. Uh, those are among the more difficult um, and dangerous. We are thinking through it right now, actually, to figure out what would be safer. Would it be safer to allow hairdressers and barbers to make appointments and go to people's homes? Or would it be safer to keep them in a more controlled environment, but at a very limited work schedule with new regulations and mask wearing and temperature taking? So short answer is I'm not sure. It's top of mind for me because we have a lot of them in Rhode Island. Only good news is just a reminder, I still hear confusion, hairdressers, barbers, uh, 
um, any self-employed people, gig economy workers, independent contractors, you are, avail you are eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. You're usually not, but you are now. So until I can figure out a way to get you open safely, please go to the DLT website and file for unemployment insurance benefits. Great segue to our next question from Michael Bilo of Motif Magazine. Unemployment insurance applicants say on Twitter they are confused by DLT sending email telling everyone to recertify weekly even if they haven't yet been approved and telling them to create a PIN but requiring a benefit year ending code they haven't yet been sent. Can the message be clarified? The answer is certainly yes, because I'm even confused by that question. So let me get on that today, and I will clarify it for everybody tomorrow. Ryan Belmore of What's Up Newport says, every day we're reading about concerns from our readers about cars arriving from out of state. As stay-at-home orders get lifted, people are likely going to head to Rhode Island for their summer vacations and day trips. What steps will be taken mm -hmm. this spring and summer to keep Rhode Islanders safe and the domestic travel resumers? from not coming? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And again, similar to the other question, I don't yet know. Um, it, to be clear with everyone, it's going to take at least another week to two weeks before I have detailed answers to these sorts of questions. This is exactly the kind of thing we're working on quite literally 24-7, industry by industry, regulation by regulation. And as we develop guidelines, I will share them. I'm talking to experts, public health experts, my fellow governors. I've joined a regional compact to work with Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, the rest of New England. So it, there's no quick fix on this. I want to be as thoughtful as possible. Um, with respect to that, though, I will say this. If, if you look at the experience of other countries, uh, they do get into trouble when they allow a lot of cross-border um, interactions. Now, obviously, a country is different than a state, but all of which is to say, I could see us having, and other states having, s continued restrictions on travelers, or at least, if not restrictions, a requirement that folks check in so they know that they are we they are here and they're healthy, or if they're not healthy, they're in quarantine. So I, I don't have a good answer. As I say, I'm coordinating with other governors. We'll have a regional response. But you're right to ask the question because that cross-border flow is an issue. Richard Asnoff of Convergence RI asks, are there plans to conduct random tests of asymptomatic populations in Rhode Island for antibodies to develop a better understanding of the extent of community transmission? Yes, Richard. Uh, we are trying to, the answer is yes. We're trying to figure out how large of a sample, how frequently to do that. Um, we could just, we could do um, the serologic test or we may just do the diagnostic test of the kind that we're currently using. So one way or another, though, we do need to get a better measure of what we think is going on in the population, how many people, approximately what percent of our population has been exposed or has had the virus. John Howell of the Warwick Beacon asks, we are hearing that some CARES Act Paycheck Protection Program funds are reaching businesses. Other businesses that have their applications approved have yet to receive their loans. It appears some banks are expediting these applications and others are not. Mm. How are you tracking how this is working? Great question. Uh, there's been a good deal of confusion in the payroll protection program. And of course, we the money ran out. So my top priority is to get Congress to act immediately to replenish the program because there are a lot of businesses that weren't able to get there fast enough. So that's number one priority. Secondly, we're in touch with banks on a regular basis to find out who's doing what, pushing them where we can. We are in touch constantly with small business associations, chambers of commerce, uh, I rely on the Manufacturers Association, so we're trying to keep our ear to the ground. Having said that, if, if you're having a problem or if you know someone who's having a problem, send them to me. Send them to the governor's office. Send them to uh, 521-HELP, which is the commerce hotline. We are tackling a lot of things one at a time, helping one business at a time. Um, 
My real goal, though, is we need more money. We need to replenish the fund in order to help small businesses, all of them, get some kind of relief. Tanya Signori of the Rhode Island Echo says, distance learning is great and has benefits. However, there is cheating going on. Some students are honest while others are not. As a result, there are inflated grades. Governor, what is your message to the students that are continuing to do the wrong thing? Do the right thing. There's never an excuse to do the wrong thing. Don't cheat. You just hurt yourselves, and it's not fair to your classmates. But I would say to all the students out there and all the kids, I, I interact with a lot of kids, they want to know what can we do. Well, go out of your way to do what your parents tell you to do and do what your teachers tell you to do and do what the adults in your life are asking you to do. I know a lot of kids are frustrated. This isn't the spring they wanted. They're anxious. They're angry. And I get all that. But us adults are too, and we're trying to take care of you. So the best thing you can do for yourself to keep yourselves happy and safe and other people in your life, you know, just try a little extra hard to do what your teachers are telling you to do, do what your parents are telling you to do. It's a tough time for everybody. Now is not the time to cheat or get around the rules. If there's ever a time to follow the rules, it's right now. And I'd, I'd appreciate it, and I'd be proud of you if you did that. Kim Kalunian of WPRI says Governor Cuomo said today he would launch antibody testing for thousands this week. Where does Rhode Island stand in an effort to do the same? So we're a few weeks away from that. We are still, um, you know, New York is a couple of weeks ahead of us, obviously, right? They peaked a few weeks ago. They're coming down the curve. So we are still in the thick of of our uh, traditional testing, the PCR test, the testing with the equipment um, before we move into the antibody testing. We will get there. Um, by the way, there's an issue of supply on that as well. I would like to point out that right now Rhode Island is doing more testing per capita than any other state in the country. In fact, yesterday there was a Harvard professor who came out and said that Rhode Island is the only state in the country which is doing enough testing that we could even think about reopening. So um, it doesn't mean I'm stopping. We're doing 2,000 a day now to reopen the economy. We need multiples of that. But as far as testing goes, Rhode Island is leading the pack. I feel good about it. And then the kind of testing you're talking about is, is still a few weeks away. Scott Isaacs of NBC10 News says the executive order says businesses must require customers to wear masks. Yesterday you said they must remind customers to wear face coverings. Just now you said must wear. Could you please say mm -hmm. unequivocally, are Rhode Islanders required to wear masks inside customer facing businesses? Yes, thank you for that question. So the answer to your question is yes, unequivocally, for sure, in the executive order, Every customer who goes to a store of any kind, pharmacy, grocery store, any essential retailer, liquor store, must wear a mask. The only exceptions are if you're two years old or younger, or if your doctor says that wearing a mask would endanger your own health. There are some people for whom it's an issue. So that is unequivocally clear. Um, the issue where there was a bit of confusion, what I haven't said yet is that um, the stores can throw you out if you're a customer who doesn't have a mask on. Uh, now, I, there are some mayors who are thinking of that, and of course they're free to have a more stringent uh, set of guidelines. I haven't gone there yet. As I said, we looked at 200 businesses yesterday and compliance was pretty good. So if I have to change, I will. Uh, but right now, to be crystal clear, every Rhode Islander is ordered to wear a cloth face covering, covering your nose and your mouth every time you're in any retail operation or at work or anywhere. Elise Major of Providence Monthly says personal safety apps are being developed that allow users to accurately track their social distancing score in real time. Do you think tools like this might be implemented as the state begins to reopen? Yes, I do. It's a great question. We're looking at all different kinds of apps. Um, there's a balance, of course, 
between respecting people's um, privacy rights and civil liberties. And anything that I would do would be, would be an opt-in. So rather than forcing someone to do it, we'd encourage them to opt-in. But we're looking at all kinds of um, different apps around symptom tracking, around uh, contact tracing, GPS tracking. We're even looking at ways to gamify it so that it's fun and it's not a chore to opt in. I think over the next handful of months, you'll probably see a lot of creativity popping up, and I'll, I'll look forward to taking advantage of, of any good ideas that can keep Rhode Islanders safe. Our last question today is from Liza Gordon of Noticias, Rhode Island. Is there any kind of benefits or help for people that do not have a social security number but work and pay their taxes using an ITIN number? Uh, there is, and I will follow up with you um, specifically on that. It, it varies a bit depending on um, program to program. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good day.